I'm Professor Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. Today I want to spend a few minutes delving into Gibbs free energy uh, because it's one of the most important ways that we look at energy in biological thermodynamics and chemical thermodynamic systems. And I really, the, the goal is to motivate looking at Gibbs free energy and how it gets to something that you would say we uh, start to use a ton in biological or chemical systems, which is equilibrium constant. In fact, oftentimes we synonymously think of the Gibbs free energy in its relationship to this. And so we're going to spend a few slides just looking at some buildup to this uh, so that when we start talking about equilibrium uh, thermodynamics and looking at chemical reactions, biochemical changes, etc., in terms of equilibrium constants, we'll have some background and context for this. So, one of the things that quickly comes up is you see a lot of things that the molar free energy is, you know, the, the chemical potential, or a lot of times it gets thrown around between uh, free energy, Gibbs free energy, and chemical potential, and really, you know, what's going on between them. And this all stems from, you know, what we start as. Like I've always said, like, one of the only things I truly remember as far as equations in thermodynamics is what I think of as kind of the combined first second law. But one of the Legendre transforms or transforms to a different type of energy besides internal energy that's extremely useful in the biological and chemical sciences is the Gibbs free energy. And this is a, you know, a Legendre transform on both PV work, mechanical work, and heat. Um, and so, and it switches the dependent variables from uh, internal energy of entropy, volume, and number of moles to temperature, pressure, and number of moles, as we've seen here. So, um, and one of the reasons this is so critical is, is that a lot of times in biological systems or chemical systems will often hold temperature and pressure constant and watch a reaction. We will do something, you know, medically at a fixed temperature, say 37 degrees Celsius body temperature, and a fixed pressure roughly of about, you know, an atmosphere or so. The pressure changes, you know, within your body are, are fairly small. Uh, the temperature changes the same. So oftentimes these can be considered to be constant. And then really look at what is changing about the number of moles or the constituents or composition of a system, what type of reactions are going, what type of forward and backward uh, changes in a system are happening. So this is you know, how we build thermodynamics. Uh, and one of the things we said, because this energy, just like the internal energy, is a state function, it's independent of path, we can use exact differentiation, we can expand this uh, as a set of three partials, uh, where I've just listed, you know, the partials here that we're looking at. Um, so uh, we can look at it, you know, with respect to temperature, you know, pressure, you know, and number of moles of a system. Um, and, you know, this one, as we can see from the equation above, is related to the entropy. This partial, how the Gibbs free energy changes with pressure, is related at constant temperature and number of moles is related to volume. And the one that we're going to really look at today, because we're often holding these constant, is how the Gibbs energy changes with the number of moles, how it changes with composition as a function of fixed temperature and pressure. And that goes as the chemical potential. In fact, we often, uh, you know, say that the chemical potential is the molar Gibbs free energy of a system. So when we're looking at this, it's oftentimes now, instead of just looking at, you know, where we use a capital N to, to say that, you know, the fixed composition, in other words, kind of a, that kind of almost implies a single component system. Now is when we're really going to look at what we've shown all along, but we really haven't addressed, which is we're really summing over multiple components of a system. Um, so I, the ith component. And so I've made a small version here. So, you know, this, for example, is classically, you know, would have four components. Some component A, 
some component B in the starting mixture, and it could react to form C and D. So at any one time, we could have up to you know, four components. So we could write this as, instead of just generically as the sum, we could say it's the number of moles of each of those components, right? And oftentimes we go from a capital N, which is often used to say the total number of moles or indicate the total in something, we often use a small n and then the subscript of which component we're talking about. However, you will also see me every once in a while use a capital uh, in, in a uh, superscript A um, kind of interchangeably here. So um, again, now we can you know, look at this. And so now we can write out the fundamental equation for Gibbs free energy as you know, the heat, the mechanical work. And now this chemical work term, we write it out as all of the individual components for this specific system, one that has four components associated with it, A with its stoichiometric coefficient, sub A, B with its stoichiometric coefficient, et cetera. Right? Now, just integrating from something that we, we started with no, no number of moles of anything to start with, so we would have zero free energy right, associated with it, to whatever state we're talking about, you know, and um, so that's gonna give, you know, G minus zero, and then we can integrate over from Z, we start with nothing, no number of moles of anything, to the number of moles of each one of those components, right? So it'll come through here, zero to NA, you know, zero to NB, et cetera. Um, and, you know, it gives, you know, this relationship. And so, you know, this points out very explicitly how the Gibbs free energy is this, you know, chemical work of just adding up each of these components associated with it. So that kind of gets us to this point and, and helps explain each of these components. Um, so um, now let's look at it in terms of something we're familiar with, which is, you know, so we're doing this reaction, you know, A and B, you know, two, you know, with their molar coefficients, you know, going to form C and D. Like, for example, one mole of A reacts with three moles of B, some compound to form one mole of C and, and four moles of D. So we start, you know, with one mole um, of A here, we start with three moles of B here, and, you know, they react, um, and, you know, what ends up, you know, are four moles of D and, and one mole of C, right? And what we wanna look at is what we mean by this extent of reaction. So, and we use this to set up a lot. So, you know, we, we know the two end states, you know, if this reaction is spontaneous. So if we, if we, we could say what the end states are if we go 100% this way, right? Which is, this is showing. Um, so, you know, um, we can look at constant, and we'll do this at constant temperature and pressure being constant, so that we're only looking at the chemical work term here. And we're gonna define the extent of reaction is how each one of these changes, the number of moles of each of the constituents, A, B, C, D, change over their you know, stoichiometric coefficient or keeping track of how much each one of them are. And we're gonna, realize that any time A is formed, you know, it, it's, if, if C is formed, it's at the cost of A and B, and same with D, right? So they're gonna come negative associated with those, right? And so now we can define it in terms of not how the number of moles changes, but the extent of reaction based that the number of moles they, don't, they can't change randomly. You can't just randomly add C to it. It's only because of the combination of A and B that can do it. So taking into account the chemical formula that defines it. Um, and this now allows us uh, to uh, measure out this extent of reaction. And so, where we want to get to this, and this is what we're, you know, one of the driving forces for looking at this extent of reaction. So to be able to follow these individual components, right? But now we can say, how does the Gibbs free energy change as a function of the extent of the reaction? 
And this is something we already have a feel for, which is we know because of the maximizing of entropy based on the second law, that energy is often minimized in this process. In fact, uh, you can show, we've shown this in the lecture notes, et cetera. And so this gives us a way to you know, find this minimum when this extent of reaction or this change you know, uh, is happening here and here, but it comes and we find you know, the equilibrium you know, in the system. And you can see based on how we've set up this extent of the reaction, and this is starting to look familiar. CD minus AB. In other words, you just, if you uh, start producing C and D, they come at the expense of A and B, right? Because we're looking at a specific case in this, right? So this will change depending on what your exact reaction uh, stoichiometry or equation is. And this gives us a preview of where we're going. We, we have a sense for what the equilibrium constant is from general chemistry, general physics, et cetera, mainly general chemistry and biology, that we know it's kind of the products over the reactants. And you can see that this is heading in this direction, the products here you know, over uh, the reactants. And it's going to come, uh, these are going to get over each other instead of being a difference uh, because of uh, this natural log that comes up. And, and the way I kind of motivate this is we often start looking at these reactions in the gas phase, right? And so if we look at it in the gas phase, um, you know, we know that, uh, um, you know, the change, you know, so we can look at, you know, gas pressures, for example, and we can, you know, uh, integrate, um, you know, over uh, this, you know, this will be, uh, you know, um, if it's an ideal gas, will be, you know, nRT over P. In other words, P comes inversely to this, which is what gives this natural log. So you can see where we're, we're heading with this. So for something, you know, that we often start with reactions, just simple gas phase reaction, treat them ideally, um, we can look at the Gibbs free energy. Uh, it will go as, you know, nRT over the natural log of the pressure over your initial pressure, we often call P0, right? And so you can see where this is heading. We can also say that this is because we can make this relationship that this is, you know, the chemical potential minus some, um, you know, the, chemi the initial standard state chemical potential, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this will go, you know, more or less with this same relation except the N because the chemical potential is the molar free energy, so it'll just go as RT ln of P over P0, right? And so we can see, you know, that we're heading kind of in this direction, you know, that, and, and what you're gonna have is a, a series of partial pressures of, of the um, different constituents over each other, and those are related to the mole fractions or the concentration or the amount of each one. And so this is kind of where we're headed uh, theoretically in this way. So in summary, really, where does this head? The, the, uh, the concept that the free energy, which we use extensively in biological and chemical thermodynamics to tell us about the spontaneity of a reaction or if a reaction is at equilibrium, right? Or if it's, if it's spontaneous or not spontaneous in some direction, right? Um, and we often do these at constant temperature and pressure so that we're just looking at the chemical work term. And this gives free energy because of it being an exact differential really relates down to the equality of the molar free energy being these chemical potentials. And it's really the chemical potential of things to react or change that we're most interested in, uh, in the system. So I hope that gives you an overview of kind of where we're heading in, to a, a comp important concept that we already use in chemistry and biological sciences all the time, which is um, uh, the Gibbs free energy to look at reactions or any type of biological or chemical process. It's relationship to the fundamental concept of chemical potential and how this is eventually going to uh, relate to equilibrium constants, which is often how we express or use um, chemical potentials or free energies a lot to look at equilibrium to know whether or which direction uh, reactions are heading or where their uh, equilibrium is more towards products or more towards reactants, et cetera. Thank you.